Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's Vision Zero Challenge webinar. So today's presentation uh, brought to you by the Vision Zero Academy of Sweden uh, will be on two parts. First, we're going to go into vehicle safety, and then uh, we're going to have a presentation on road design environment and road safety. Welcome to all the Vision Zero Challenge cities. Uh, we're very delighted to have you again this year with another series of webinars and activities. Uh, we also welcoming uh, cities all around the world who are joining us today to take a look at the Vision Zero Challenge and what we're doing in the region. Uh, we welcome the Vision Zero Challenge partners. Um, we have the FIA Foundation, the Fundación Gonzalo Rodriguez, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, ITF, Latin NCAP, Towards Zero Foundation, um, our host Vision Zero Challenge, the Vision Zero Academy, UK Aid, DRSF, and the World Bank. And we also thank our sponsors, 3M, TTV Group, and Volvo Group, to uh, make this initiative happen. And just a kind reminder that um, share your questions and comments in the chat window. Uh, when you're doing that, make sure they're being sent to all panelists and all attendees so that we can all see your questions and spark some good discussions. And now I'm going to introduce our guests from today, from the Vision Zero Academy. Uh, first, we have Ricard. Fredrickson, uh, he is a senior advisor and associate professor of transport administration at Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. And then on the second presentation, we're gonna have Dr. Lars Ekman, who has been a guest in previous webinars of uh, the Vision Zero Challenge last year. He's a senior advisor on road safety for the Swedish transport administration. And now I'm going to give the floor over to Ricard for your first presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I will try to share my presentation. Is it showing in full screen now? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, so my name is Richard Fredriksson, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I should just clarify, I'm working for the Swedish Transport Administration, but I'm also an associate professor at Chalmers uh, in uh, vulnerable road user safety. Uh, and uh, my focus my focus is on vehicle safety. I, I forgot to say I have a long background from the vehicle industry working on uh, vehicle safety system uh, research and development. So I will talk today about uh, vehicle safety uh, today and what we will see in the near future. And a large focus will be on your ANCAP where we are one of the founding members and the, and the partners. So Vision Zero uh, consists of three parts, safe roads, safe use and safe vehicles. And uh, as I mentioned, I will uh, focus today on the safe vehicle part, but of course they need to work together. But this is uh, what I will focus on today. Euro NCAP, as I mentioned, uh, is, a, is a European uh, cooperation with eight member countries. Uh, and you see the partners here um, as of now mainly Western Europe and mainly vehicle producing countries. And we also have uh, test labs in all of the member countries. So the tests are uh, performed at different test labs. Uh, we have seen that your ANCAP has been very successful in driving vehicle safety. And this is showing uh, the fatal uh, risk for a car occupant, how it has decreased uh, since the 80s and uh, in the 90s when uh, uh, your ANCAP was uh, introduced. 
Uh, and the right graph shows the same uh, development, but for a disability, permanent medical impairment, where we also have seen a huge uh, reduction of injuries. Uh, we also see it spreading around the world. Uh, we, we see ANCA programs uh, in basically all, all continents as of now, and where uh, India is coming soon, as we hope. Uh, the way uh, it works in your ANCAP is that we uh, launch a, a new test and requirement, uh, and then give uh, consumer information on tested cars of the safety uh, level of the car. And this drives the market uh, competition between the brands and the uh, drives new safety innovations in the cars. And then uh, it is a circle the, where we increase the requirements uh, and uh, introduce new requirements. And then it's a, a circle that drives the, the safety level higher and higher. So uh, the Eurancap test uh, of today uh, consists of four areas adult occupant, child occupant, vulnerable road users, and uh, safety assist, which is uh, ADAS systems. And in total, 32 uh, different tests that we perform on every car. Uh, the last normal year uh, before COVID was 2019. Uh, and then we tested 55 uh, cars, new cars on the market. So, basically all new cars on the market and 75% uh, of the tested cars were five stars so it's been uh, very successful to drive also the safety level up that most most car brands want to be five stars and if you look at the market coverage 70% uh, of the sold vehicles in Europe 2018 this is was five stars so this also shows how, how uh, successful it is that the, the car companies want to be five stars. Uh, if you look at uh, if the star levels really reflect safety level, this was a study done in Sweden a few years ago, and it shows that the five star car is 40% uh, lower risk of a fatal injury than a two-star car. And the same uh, thing for disability, permanent medical impairment is also significantly lower uh, injury risk for a five-star car to a two-star car. So this shows that the tests are actually working in real life too. So what is new? Uh, as of last year, last year was the latest update. Normally it's a two year uh, um, interval between new tests and, uh, and uh, raising of requirements. So last year we had the latest uh, update of, of requirements. One new test last year was far side crash, uh, which, where I hope you can see the video here where uh, you both look at occupant to occupant uh, interaction in a far side crash, as you see here, the, the two dummies in the front seat. And it's, uh, it drives an airbag between the occupants. And we saw that uh, last year, the 11 tested cars, eight, eight of the cars had uh, this protection already in the first year. Uh, another new test last year was for ADAS for uh, AEB uh, auto brake. In the car to car test, we introduced a new test uh, for left turn across path. If you want to make a left and you actually don't see a car approaching you, this system will prevent you from, uh, from turning and uh, break the car. For vulnerable road users, for pedestrians, there were two new tests uh, for turning on the left. Uh, 
on the left side of the graph when you uh, turn a uh, right turn in this case. This is a bit more demanding than uh, earlier tests because you need a wide field of view to see the dummy. And also we introduced a reversing uh, test that it, the car should stop if you reverse against the pedestrian. Another new area was rescue. Uh, if you have a crash, the rescue personnel uh, needs to know where uh, the safety systems uh, are located in the car so they can uh, take the occupants out in a safe way and if necessary, cut the vehicle in a safe way. And this is also very important now with the, the, the rapid increase of electrical vehicles which uh, introduces a lot of potentially unsafe areas in the car to cut for the uh, rescue personnel. So this, uh, in this way, um, the car makers are asked to make this rescue sheet for each car model. And this is in, oh, sorry, I thought I had a picture. This is in an, in an app. You can download an app and look uh, immediately for a certain car model where, what, uh, what the car looks like. So this is the uh, example for Audi A3. Uh, this year we tested 11 cars so far, and you see them on the right here. Uh, so also here, mostly five-star cars, a few four-star cars and two two-star cars. So it's still a spread, but uh, still the majority wants to be five stars. Uh, and you can also go um, yourself into the URANCAP website. This is official uh, data. So you can go into the website and uh, look up any car and see all the details of the test and, and the scoring. And this is, of course, uh, especially important if for the private uh, consumer. If he wants to buy a new car, he can compare the different cars and the safety level of them. So this, uh, see if this works. This is a video, I hope it's running, of uh, one of the latest tested cars and it shows uh, some, some of the tests. This is the Polestar 2 launched this year and tested by Urancap. So first adult occupant. The new frontal test, which is performed against a moving progressive deformable barrier, which also measures the compatibility of the car, how aggressive it is to the counterpart. So this is the full frontal test uh, against rigid barrier, where it, this focuses more on the, uh, on the restraint systems in the vehicle. Side impact, 60 kilometers per hour uh, barrier into the side of the car. The pole test, which is performed in 32 kilometers per hour, which drives the side impact Head protection. So uh, most of the cars have a side curtain now. The whiplash test is performed on an isolated seat on a sled. Child protection is assessed in the same test that we just saw the, with child dummies in the rear seat, a six year old and a 10 year old both frontal and in this case, side impact. Vulnerable road users consist both of impact tests, in this uh, case, head uh, against hood and upper leg against hood edge. And finally, uh, lower leg form against the bumper. 
So it's component tests. For ADA systems for vulnerable road users, we have different scenarios. In this case, a crossing pedestrian, crossing pedestrian at night time. And the turning uh, that I showed you before, the new scenario. Also, bicyclists was introduced in 2018, the new test then. And finally, car to car aid assistance, uh, safety assist, auto brake in a rear accident. Typical highway accident or stop stoplight if you're distracted. This is the new left turn across path. This is lane support systems that help to keep you in the lane. It steers back if you leave the lane unintentionally. And also road edge detection without a line is tested. And also with a car in the next lane, approaching from behind. Okay, so that's what it looks like now. Uh, and then uh, next steps uh, coming in your NCAP is uh, for bicyclists, we will increase the wraparound distance. So we will test higher on the car up to 2.5 meters now measured from the ground and up because bicyclists uh, hit higher on the car. There is also a new pedestrian leg form uh, introduced in the test, which is supposed to be more human-like with an upper body mass in, included. Uh, we will also look into crossing traffic when you stop at a four-way crossing and uh, there's a car coming from the side. This system should prevent you from, from entering the road or crossing the road. And also head-on collisions. If a car comes against you in your own lane, overtaking or drifting, this system should reduce the crash speed. Uh, it will not prevent the crash, but it's uh, designed to reduce the crash speed of up to 20 kilometers per hour, which we know makes a huge difference in uh, fatal risk. For A, B, auto brake bicyclists, there's a new scenario with the door opening. If you park your car, uh, um, on the road and there is a bicyclist coming from behind, this system should detect that the bicyclist is coming and prevent you from opening the door. A new area is also child presence detection. We know, uh, especially from the US, there has been reported a lot of accidents where uh, parents leave their child behind or either intentional or unintentionally uh, and don't realize that it uh, can be dangerous that it's too hot in the car this system should detect that there is a child left in the car and warn uh, um, the parents or the car owner and uh, escalate the warnings if they don't uh, uh, rescue the child or even intervene uh, and for example, open windows uh, or something like that of the car. For power two wheelers, motorcycles, uh, this is a new area also for auto brake for ADAS that we, the cars should detect motorcycles. In different scenarios, we see left turn here, same as for car to car. Crossing scenario is another scenario and uh, oncoming and rear impact. So also several scenarios uh, there in, in two years from now to detect and, and prevent the crash with a, with a motorcycle. 
which is really necessary because we don't see that uh, injuries or fatalities are decreased for motorcyclists in the same way as there are for car occupants. We, we see a new uh, possibility with the virtual testing in the future. Uh, car makers are doing this already for internal development, but we think that this could also be used in, uh, in ANCAP testing and assessment. And if we can start using virtual dummies or even human body models, uh, we, there is really a paradigm shift uh, coming we can then do a lot more crash speed, different occupant sizes and impact angles, which is now limited because you can only perform so many crash tests. Uh, and we can also then introduce more real human in injury criteria when you have a human body model, for example, brain injury or actually bone, bone fractures that are not possible today with a crash dummy, which is much more simplified. This can also be done in uh, ADAS testing. Uh, we are looking into using virtual testing also there, where you can introduce many more tests and, many, and also more complex scenarios with the number of different vehicles and vulnerable road users at the same time to make it more real life. Uh, the last area I will talk about is driver attention, uh, which we think is very important also. This is also a new area for the 2023, where we see that uh, it's a big problem that drivers are uh, tired, drowsy or distracted, and this can cause many accidents and also really severe accidents. So we uh, will test what we say, what we call occupant state monitoring for fatigue or drowsiness, distraction and sudden sickness will also be tested. Driving under influence will also be included, but that's more indirect because we know that the drunk driver typically get the same symptoms, so to say, as a distracted or a drowsy, tired driver. So this uh, requires some technology to detect, uh, and it, this is typically a camera detecting eye and head motion and the direction of the eyes and the head to see what you're looking at and how, for how long. So the time plan is that we will introduce this in 2023 for the first time for direct systems. Now we have it for indirect, which is what we call a coffee, coffee cup system that's more just uh, the steering uh, motion of the car. But the uh, next step is then the cameras. And in 2025, we will only allow direct systems to award points. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I can answer questions now, but if you want, you can also send me an email later uh, with questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rikal, for the great presentation. Um, we'll invite uh, participants to submit questions through the chat for a couple of minutes. So feel free okay. to enter. Hi, Alejandro, we have a first question in the chat. So if I may read it, uh, what progress has been made in making visible the difference in vehicle impact and repercussion between men and women? Uh, so, sorry, I, I lost you there for a second. Uh, can you repeat it? Thanks, Hako uh, oh, I can read it again. Yes, please. What progress has been made in making visible the difference in vehicle impact and repercussion between men and women? Uh, 
I have a bit of difficulty, but I think I, I heard you. Uh, what difference uh, has been made for men and women? Uh, it's a very good question because it's uh, been a big focus on men in crash protection. The 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 crash dummy is an average male, so we we have a small female in the test uh, by now uh, to have the large uh, spread between uh, male and female. But I think what is necessary is uh, what I mentioned, virtual testing, where we can really include different sizes of occupants in a, in a much better way. So I think we can do a lot more than we are doing now. Great, thank you, Ricard. We have another question. I'll read it uh, here. From the goal of Vision Zero, what is the state of the art of the application of the techno of to technology in passenger transport vehicles? The state of the art, uh, I would say, is for us, uh, Eurancap is a very important tool. We use it as uh, the indicator for safe uh, vehicles in Sweden. We we uh, we have a goal. We had a goal of last year to have eighty percent of the highest safety level in Eurancap, and we we reached that. So that has been one of our best uh, performing in safety indicators in in Sweden. So that is uh, really how we drive vehicle safety with emissions here in Sweden. have two, two more questions. May I have a, a read? There's one. Why impact test has male dominance? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a long history uh, that from the beginning, the, the first crash dummy was an average male. And it was based on average uh, soldiers in the US Army. And they were only male. So uh, but it's also to be male. It's a very, very muscular male. So uh, from then on, it's it's been based uh, on the average male. So, but as I said, hopefully this will change when we can start using virtual testing and use a much larger spread uh, of occ occupant sizes. Great. Um, I'll read another one. Please, Alejandro, if, let me know if we have the time. So in Colombia, the proportion of motorcyclists involved in accidents is increasing. What advances are being made in vehicle safety for motorcycles? I think the most important and first step should be to introduce ABS uh, as standard on all motorcycles worldwide. And we are having those discussions actually right now. In, uh, we had a global workshop a couple of weeks ago that we are trying to summarize now. Uh, but also more advanced uh, systems like what I showed today, car systems that should prevent crashes with motorcyclists, maybe communication between uh, other vehicles and motorcycles. And of course, that you wear a helmet and, uh, and protection. So, so there are several systems coming in, uh, advanced systems coming in Europe, for example, that could spread uh, well when the costs go down. Yeah. So we need to introduce them at least somewhere and then the cost can go down and they can spread to the rest of the world. I think motorcycles are a great concern in Latin America also. Mm -hmm. So I'll read another, I think the last question, so we can move for the presentations. Uh, why is it that cars, most cars do not have their rescue sheet when buying the vehicle? This one is from uh, Rene Flores from Mexico. So this was... Uh... If I understood it right, this was a very new uh, requirement or um, 
from last year in your rank up and uh, after from last year all the cars tested uh, as i understand have this now so it should be if we wait a few years it should be available for for all, all car models but of course since it's new it will take some years typically it takes at least six years because uh, before all uh, car models are are replaced Thank you very much, Ricard, and everyone for your questions. Any additional questions on this topic can also be revisited later. And for now, we'll give the floor uh, to Lars for the next presentation. Um, thanks a lot. I will try to share my screen. I don't um, So, and now I just have to start my presentation and hopefully you can see my screen now. And I, I'm not on mute, I hope. Yes, we can see it. Oh, lovely. Uh, yeah, so I, I will talk about um, row design and uh, Richard and I can compete on what is most important and we will lose both of us because it's a, the, 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 the elegance here is actually that the, the road and the, the uh, vehicle and the humans should be uh, in, in a good balance or, or link or whatever. But I would talk about road design and that is actually our core business as a, uh, at the, the Swedish Transport Administration. I mean, we administrate, build and plan and maintain all our, our roads. So I've, I of course think that road design is very important. And um, uh, further questions and so on, I'm, I'm happy to answer that by, by mail and being in other contexts and so on. I will start with this picture showing that when we do infrastructure project, it's quite hefty project. They're expensive, we do quite a lot, and uh, there is so much room for doing the very best things when it comes to safety and also to have built in unsafety. And many people think that traffic safety work is an after thing. You should fix things afterwards. But when and if we succeed with this, it's utterly important that you do that when you plan and build new roads. And sometimes I'm actually I envy you many of you working in, in developing countries because you have so much more in front of you and don't have to build the, 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 the wrong way as, as we have done and have to replace it. So doing the good thing from the beginning is very important. And quite often we get the, the question of how do big traffic safety budgets do you have in Sweden? And I can say we don't have very big safety budgets, but we have a quite a hefty budget for road construction, road building and road maintenance. <clears throat> and the trick when it comes to doing good things in, in road environment, it's actually to make the big money working for you. Building good traffic safety uh, solutions when you build things. So when you're moving gravel here or putting asphalt or putting uh, equipment here, if you do that in, in a good way, in a safe way, you could work uh, uh, actively to improve safety. So that's actually my, my first and very big, big uh, message is don't think that traffic safety is something extra added on to our road infrastructure. It's absolutely an integrated part and need to be there. And this picture we, we, we show quite often uh, and I've uh, uh, borrowed the, the picture of the safe vehicle from, from, from Richard, uh, namely that we need to have a good vehicle and a good road and it need to be used in a safe manner and the the good vehicle we have heard quite a lot of and i think it's actually the same uh, vehicle that you've you've seen on, on videos and so on and the 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 safe road is represented here by a road with a mid barrier and when we started to 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 look at the, the or 
introduced division zero, we, we had reflections that sometimes you could actually go quite fast with a car and it's relatively safe. For instance, on a racetrack, it, it's relatively safe to go on a racetrack because they all go in the same direction. But imagine a racetrack where 50% of the competition uh, go the other way around. There should be a slaughter. So actually making the, the road user to uh, go in the same direction is one of the, the, the most important things when it comes to good uh, infrastructure safety. And we do that with put, put up a mid barrier. And that has, we have done for generations when it comes to motorways. But here, I think it's something could be interesting for so many more countries to have a much cheaper uh, way of building safe roads. Namely, this is the two plus one road. And, and whether it's a two plus one or two plus two or whatever, it's the mid barrier that is so important so that all traffic go in the same direction. Eliminating the head-on collision is a very, very vital part of, of uh, infrastructure safety. And that doesn't mean that we need all the facilities that we have on a motorway. The important thing is actually the mid barrier. So that is one of, of my really um, uh, important message. But then, of course, it, they need to be used in a proper manner. If you're sitting in one of, of Rickard's very nice vehicles and don't using the seatbelts, it doesn't matter. You, you, all the safety, virtually all of the safety system will be useless if you don't wear a seatbelt. And if you have a, if you have a, a, a driving under the influence of alcohol, you could do lots of other uh, stupid things. And you do use it in a very wrong way. For instance, the, if you go in the wrong direction on a, on a motorway or two plus one road, the whole idea is, is lost. And of course, speed. Speed uh, is a very, very important part. So uh, uh, speed control and speed management is, is utterly important, just both when it comes to setting speed limits, but also to, to enforce it. So that, that is a, a very vital part. But the idea is actually that you, we have to have a combination of, of these three. And we are, I'm often blamed, or we often blame to, to be talking too much about v, uh, cars and so on. But we have the same, same system when it comes to, to urban situation and vulnerable road use. Where we need to have the safe environment, in this case, it's represented by zebra crossing with, with, a, um, with a hump or a, uh, with a raised uh, zebra crossing, um, where you can guarantee low speed. And you need to have a safe bicycle and unfortunately I don't have a very fancy picture of a safe bicycle because the development when it comes to bicycle and safety has been very 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 slow compared to to the development when it comes to, to cars. The only safe thing with this uh, uh, bicycle here is actually ABS brakes and I heard Rick had mentioned that as the the number one safety feature for for powered two-wheelers. So ABS brakes is actually uh, now very possible. And I do have some hopes when you put a battery on the bicycle, which is done very rapidly nowadays, lots of the safety equipment that we now see take as, as a normal thing for cars could actually be applied uh, to, uh, to, to bicycles as well, because the, you have the, the power uh, as, soon, as soon as you have the, the battery. But of course you need to have good protection system, like uh, in this case, it's actually a Swedish invention with a inflatable uh, bicycle helmets, but uh, ordinary good uh, bicycle helmets will, will do very well, of course. But then it's actually back to quite simple uh, civil engineering when it comes to, to for instance, the pedestrian crossing safety uh, in urban areas. There are actually two ways to tackle this. Either you have a separation or you do traffic calming. And separation we know works very well. This is an intersection where I studied um, severe uh, incident or crashes uh, when I was at Univer University uh, and this, this crossing where they 
cyclists should go to the university and we have the, the ring road. But as soon as they built the, the underpass here, where the cyclists go on a tunnel, we couldn't do those studies anymore because you could cross this uh, ring road extremely safe. Of course, it's not a cheap solution, but it's one way to go. Otherwise, you have to do the, 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 the traffic calming. But the important thing is that you actually have to do something. And one problem when it comes to road environment is that we, we could accept quite a lot of, of bad environment and bad use of our environment to an extent that it's unthinkable when it comes to other areas. And just to highlight that, I will go to a very, very simple sit situation. You have a house and a balcony. And of course you have a, a fence or a guardrail here, prevent people from falling out from, from, a, from, a, from the balcony. And at least in Sweden, you, you don't see any, any balconies without uh, fences and so on. But what happens if there, you don't have a fence here? For instance, it, it's new built house and there, there's, there was some, some uh, delay for delivering the, the, the balcony fence. What do you do then? Of course, you close the, the balcony, take the key out of the, uh, or the, the handle out of the, the, uh, the door to the, uh, to, the, to the balcony. But what if road authority would take care of balconies? They could very easily think of putting up a warning sign. Well, you could use this balcony, but you have to be aware that it's, a, it's dangerous. If you go down outside the, the balcony, you will fall down and die. And I, first of all, I couldn't find a, a balcony without a guardrail, so I had to Photoshop the, the picture, as you could see. And I'd, I couldn't find a warning sign on for balconies without guardrails. So I had to take a, a warning sign that we have in road traffic. But think of how often we actually put up a warning sign, warning for something indicating that we know that something is totally wrong, very dangerous, you should be aware. Why don't we fix it? Why don't we uh, prevent our environment to be, to be uh, dangerous? And we have done this for decades. We've done studies on different types of, of danger. And you don't see very many studies on, on uh, balconies that are accident prone. Bal balconies that are families that are more prone than others to fall out of, 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 of balconies. We have ba fence on, on all road, or on all balconies. But when it comes to road, not long ago, we thought this was the very normal road in Sweden. High speed, 90 kilometers per hour. And most people should think this is a very nice road, not even congested and nice environment and it's close to where I live in. I, I like the, the landscape and so on, but 90 kilometers per hour at head-on collisions, not even Rickard's most fancy car can cope with that. And you, you, if you slide into the, uh, to the lamppost there uh, that Rickard was testing for 30 kilometers per hour, if you do that in 90, you're really, really bad off. But we know that we can, build this road without having more land use actually with a mid barrier and all of a sudden we have a road with high safety and you could even increase speed to 100 kilometers per hour and it, when it comes to urban situation we and i presume that you have heard matsoka talking about the the comparison between a, a traffic signal and a, and and a roundabout where we have the fact that in traffic signal control intersections, we have very, very few crashes, accidents, or whatever you will call them, collisions. But if they happen, they are very likely to be fatal. If the, the lady to the right in, in the upper picture will go out and most, quite, few, quite a few actually walk against red, I've seen studies where 30% of the pedestrians actually walk against red because they think that they're no better than the system. And if there is a car, 
believing that he or she has a green light and can, can, can come at high speed, such mistakes will lead to fatalities. Whereas in the next intersection, close to this, where you have a roundabout, if there is a miscommunication and they don't have the latest uh, crash protection system uh, in, in a roundabout, that will end up with, yeah, maybe a, a slightly destroyed car and quite a lot of arguing, but normally no uh, seriously injured uh, and, and so on. So here it's a typical thing where the vision zero actually go straight on to very concrete countermeasures. You have to strive towards eliminating, preventing injuries rather than uh, crashes. In a roundabout, you could still have quite a few crashes, but they will need to very few injuries. And in a traffic signal control intersection, you could have few crashes, but they will be fatal. And then, as I said before, we were very early to put up protection system. And some of these protection systems are really, really bad, really, really dangerous. And when you now start to build new roads and so on, don't do the mistakes that we have done. This is a crash object that is actually more dangerous than falling down into the ditch, or actually, um, even if you fall down to the small uh, water there, Strid, uh, that will be more healthier than smashing into this, to this um, bridge fence. Because with such a kind of fence, they could actually go straight through the vehicle, and no vehicle could actually be how should they be protected for such uh, sharp objects actually going up? And they quite often, we have seen guardrails coming out of the glove compartment in, 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 in cars. And that is really, really bad. When we know that it's actually possible to, to create guardrails and guardrail ending that are, are safe. And these kind of, of uh, solutions are not much more expensive than the dangerous one. The idea is actually to have a system where you really check for what if, what if someone crash into this, what would happen then? And here in this case, there will be, I mean, some impact on, on the vehicle and you maybe you, you cannot uh, drive from there, but uh, it will not be as dangerous as I said before. And of course, uh, you have to find these needle, uh, needle in the hay uh, uh, barn. Um, so you need to have good control over your road network system. And in Sweden, we have this by, we have a system uh, checking for the, the, the quality of our, our road or categorizing them in red, uh, yellow and green, where the green are good. In this case, it's, it's I, I mean, in principle, it's, motorway, so two plus one road where you have a mid barrier or you have a, a low speed. And the red one are one where we have far too high speed compared to the safety system. And you could also have system checking for all your uh, intersections. And you can combine that and having a good uh, uh, system for uh, uh, checking where you have the, your safe roads and so on. And actually we have a sy similar system for, for bicycle safety. Uh, I see, I, I don't have that picture now, but a similar system where we could see uh, pedestrian and bicycle crossings in, in classified and the, the different roads for, um, for, uh, the, uh, um, um, for the bicyclists where it's safe to, to cycle or where you have potential locations where you need to, to make improvements because you need to do more, at least in Sweden, we have a huge amount of locations where we have rather dangerous roads. But um, what if we have a, a crash or fatality? And I hear so often the, the case that the, the human human error is actually the, the um, uh, the most predominant reason. And I will just take a small example, a very simple crash or accident. It's actually my little son, 
he's now adult, but when he was small, he took a glass of milk and dropped it into the floor. And the glass smashed and the accident was there. Glass all over the kitchen and I mean, really some problem. And I, as a stupid parent, of course, I shouted at him and said, you stupid boy, haven't I told you millions of times that you should hold the glass in two hands so you don't drop it? But my boy said, well, don't blame me. When I was smaller, I had a plastic mug. And if, when I dropped that, it didn't smash. We just had to clean up the milk. That's no problem. So is it actually the, the glass that is the problem or the boy? And then I had a friend at home at the time and said, he said, no, it's not the boy. It's not the glass. The problem is that you have a stone floor. Why don't you have a soft carpet on there? Then the, the glass wouldn't smash. So the same accident, the same crash could be, be explained or prevented, or the, 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 the bad consequences of this could be prevented in three different ways. Either you eliminate clumsy boys, and good luck to do that, to not having clumsy boys or girls for that matter. I don't think that's, a, uh, maybe that is a dip some difference, boys are slightly more clumsy, I admit, but, but that is really something that is very difficult to do. Or you could have glasses that are more uh, durable so they, they can cope with, it. or you could have protection system. And that is actually the same system that we are challenge here. Either we could have perfect drivers, and I say just good luck to have drivers that do no mistakes, or you could have uh, perfect vehicles, and I'm happy to say that Richard and the others are doing great progress, but you also need to have an environment that could cope with these, these uh, new cars and vehicles and so on. So preventing injuries is not straightforward, uh, given uh, by the, the, the cause of, of, uh, of, uh, of an accident or a crash. And this is very uh, good illustrated when it comes to the, to the, the balance between uh, um, active and passive safety and, and uh, where the vehicle uh, uh, manufacturers say that head-on collision could be possible uh, to prevent seriously uh, injured if the speed is not above 80 kilometers per hour. We can take care of 60 kilometers per hour in passive safety. But we, if we also have active safety with all these automatic braking system and so on, that could take care of the 20 of, of the 80 kilometers per hour, so to say. So it's rather interesting now that the car industry comes to us as the infrastructure provider saying, well, hang on, you cannot have higher speed than 80 kilometers per hour on roads where you could uh, um, have head-on collisions. If without a mid-barrier, <clears throat> we cannot have uh, that high speed. And in urban areas, you could never ever have um, higher speed than 40 kilometers per hour. And then that assumes that you have the, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the newest vehicles. So we recommend 30 kilometers per hour. And it's totally out of the Vision Zero idea to have speeds above 30 or 40 kilometers per hour where you have vulnerable road use. <clears throat> so this actually goes back to how we handle our road infrastructure. And <clears throat> if the, the future mode of transport in urban areas should be active mobility, walking, cycling, because that's the, the most efficient and most uh, best way to to, to deal with the mobility in, in, in urban dense areas because it's healthy and it's uh, uh, space efficient and, and all sorts of things. Then we have to adopt the, the road environment so we, it could incorporate with that. And you need to have appropriate uh, protection system, of course, on the, the bicyclist. And this is a Swedish example where you have quite a few actually wearing a uh, helmet. And this is a, um, a road where you have uh, low speeds and so on. So the speed 
should be in accordance to the, to, to the use of the road. And of course, there, there, there is a difference if we want to have very few cars and I mean, very seldom there, then they could be, be there if they're actually driving at, at walking speed, or you could have mixed traffic in, in, in low speed um, uh, where you could have a, quite an integrated situation. Uh, but never ever uh, above 40 kilometers per hour if, if it should be safe. And we have done some experiments here it's actually with the, where, where we could put bicyclists as the highest priority. This is an example from Gothenburg where they made a part of road. To the left is actually a trams, uh, reserved, uh, reserved for, for trams. But here it's actually meant that if there is a bicyclist, you could see bicyclists in very far distance. They are cycling on the asphalt part because it's very uncomfortable to, to, to cycle on the, on the cobblestones. Uh, so then that is the way to put cyclists in the middle and cars have to drive behind. And this is a, a way to put priority for for, for cyclists and don't squeeze in the, uh, the, the cyclist uh, between the, the car and the, uh, and, and the uh, side of, of, the, of the city. So it's actually possible to have a, a kind of shift here where you put the vulnerable road user as highest priority. And talking about a vulnerable road user, since I did my PhD on on, on uh, zebra crossings, I, I just have to talk about zebra crossing because that is one of the, of the example of, of a of very dangerous traffic safety countermeasures, countermeasure because we, politicians think that they, just by painting a zebra crossing, they have solved the problem. In my research, I checked the pedestrian risk at zebra crossing compared to crossing next to uh, intersections where you have uh, zebras and where we don't have zebras. And you could see that the pedestrian risk is twice, more than twice as high on locations where you have zebra crossing compared to where there are no zebra crossings at all. And that was a bit surprising because we have had at that time, uh, but it's, it's quite a long time now uh, since I showed this, but. So I don't think many people think that zebra crossing in itself is a safety countermeasure, but it's create a false feeling of safety because the, there will be no effect on the, on the car drivers, but very big uh, on, on, on pedestrians. Because on a zebra crossing at that time in Sweden, we give this message to the pedestrians. Here we have a perfect, safe and very, uh, well-served crossing facility. This sounds, looks very nice, doesn't it? I mean, you're actually safe to cross here and it's meant for you. But the problem is that what we give for the car drivers at the, exactly the same uh, location is actually a high-speed road where zebra crossing is actually very, very tiny uh, impression here. So it's hard to blame any car driver actually driving at relatively high speed and forgetting that there is a uh, zebra crossing. Going back to, to this situation, you can see the same location, but here you give the impression that this is a very safe and good place. Whereas this is the, the message you have for, for, the, um, uh, for the car drivers. So, The most important thing is actually here to do something about the dangerous traffic here, the cars. So a hump, a very ordinary hump, is actually the one of the best solution to take care of, of the low speed. If you have a low speed, you can cope with, with a misunderstanding who should go first and, and so on. And we also know that if the speed is low, the car drivers are so much more willing to give priority to the pedestrian. So there is a relatively simple 
solution for the problem here. Actually, make sure that you have low speed. And the simplest way is actually to, to do it by raising the, uh, the, the, the floor, so to say, and building a hump. And that is one of the, I should say, the best urban traffic safety countermeasures of all times. And if we want to create an environment where even the, the slightly weaker part of our, our uh, community should uh, having a quality of life, elderly or young people, and even, and, and it's nice to, th to think of the time when you could actually be cl close and holding hands, not being afraid of pandemics and so on. But we, this is actually the kind of, of situation we, we want to design our urban environment for. People who might have difficult hearing or lacking in experience, but they should survive even in our road environment. So road environment is a extremely important area for traffic safety work. And the lucky thing is that there's so much you can do and make such big difference. And even if it's complicated to, to do, improvements in road infrastructure last for decades. Mistakes we do in road infrastructure will last for decades. So it's utterly important. And the earlier you, you understand to, to do right, the better it is. So that was my contribution when it comes to road infrastructure, um, uh, part of, of, of safety. And I think that it's very important to realize that the, the infrastructure part is very, very important if we want to achieve zero uh, fatalities and seriously injured. So thanks a lot and I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much, Lars, for such a concrete presentation. Um, we invite everyone to provide their comments or questions on his presentation on uh, road infrastructure and road environment. A very important subject for all of us in our region where we're trying to make roads a lot safer. And um, if you have any previous questions from uh, Ricard, <clears throat> from the last presentation, also feel free to include them. Yeah, uh, I saw one of we, different types of of, uh, of um, uh, mid barrier, concrete or or uh, steel barriers and so on. I should say that, of course, they could be different. And, and it, but it, one problem with with barriers is actually that they it's very difficult to make them safe for all or vehicles. And concrete and smooth barriers are, are very, very good when it comes to two wheelers because they, they, they are very sensitive for, for poles and things putting up uh, on top of, of a steel um, uh, barriers, they, 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 they could have problems. But the, how should I say? The worst thing I know is actually when you have penetrating road ends. So our predominant problem is actually the beginning and ending of, of, of guardrails. And or actually that, that is number two. The, the first one is actually that we're missing uh, or lacking guardrails where they're really needed on all head-on collisions and also single vehicle when you smash into a tree. It would have been so much better if they ended up smashing into a guardrail. But of course, they, there is no one size fits all. There could be different types of, of, of guardrails and so on. Thank you. We have another question. Is uh, how can we measure pedestrian risks? Hmm. Oh, it almost sounds like I, I paid someone asking that question. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> because my 
my PhD was on measuring safety risk for pedestrians and cyclists. Now it, 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 it's tricky because you have the exposure both for, for the car traffic and the, the vulnerable road user. And normally, um, normally uh, we have very little information about uh, uh, pedestrian and cycle exposure. It starts to improve a little bit when it comes to cycle exposure, but it's generally rather bad. And the sad thing is, it's not uh, the the whole. My thesis is not available um, uh, on the internet. But I maybe I, if I have some time this this summer, I will try to to scan it and put it up on my my um, research uh, directory. But if it's a, a on an individual basis, I, I could um, I could support you with with some. With, with a copy, it's an old version, but it's um, it's dealing with how to to compare um, locations with lots of pedestrians to places where there are fewer and where there are lots of car traffic and and not so much traffic. Thanks. Just uh, someone just asked that if if your doctoral thesis is available in an online version. To, to review? No, it's uh, the, the abstract um, is, but but not the, the whole thesis okay. because that was before uh, the, um, the the widespread of uh, PDFs and so on. But but I, I have plans to 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 do it. Okay, that's great. We'll make yeah. sure to cite your your thesis. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. I'm I'm old now, so I, I will not be very very. I, I would not earn any money for it or any position but it's, uh, but I, I would be glad if it could be used in uh, in uh, in your scientific work thank you thank you yes we have another question um, from Geshi she said she or he I don't know he said uh, I like the story the story of boy and glass cup it's a wonderful ex example of whether we should blame the victims or let the whole system take the responsibility yeah I, I, I I've invented this uh, decades ago because I was so fed up people say well well it, it, the, it, it's the it's the uh, always the the drivers or the stupid road user yeah but good luck to create perfect pedestrians, cyclists, car drivers, or whatever. And uh, most of us have been parents and uh, understand the, the difficulties to, to do that. You, could, you have to do that, of course. But when it really comes to the, the really uh, bad consequences, like you get, uh, I mean, you wouldn't say to, uh, to your, uh, to your own son or daughter, to uh, to just uh, I've told you to do uh, to do the correct thing, uh, so you can cope you, uh, in traffic by yourself. Of course, then you hold their hand and stop them from 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 walking out when they forget to, to look to the left where, where the car is coming from. Thank you. We have another question. Um, someone asks, uh, what do you consider to be the best design for school zones, school environments? Yeah, um, I, I think I was uh, clear, I thought I was clear with that. I think actually the, the speed hump or the speed, um, <clears throat> ensuring low speed is the most important thing to, to think of in the, those environments. So I, I think that to, to some extent you could, you could rely on the, the pupils to do correct and do the right thing, but you make, have to make sure that the consequences are not fatal and you ensure that by having low speed. And you also ensure that by giving a, a decent playground for, for Richard's uh, uh, new intelligent vehicle. Because if you have an environment where you, 
you don't drive above 30 kilometers per hour, it's possible to have, create a car that actually can cope with, with uh, the consequence or if you um, happen to look at the, or you're distracted, you don't see the, the child uh, running out and then you, they could actually uh, automatically brake. But if you have 60 kilometers per hour on that road, that, that doesn't even, uh, it's not enough. And I want some confirmation from you, Richard. Yes, uh, thanks. Yeah, we have another question. Um, do you consider pedestrian desired lines should be a key variable to design urban roads? The pedestrian desired lines. Yeah, sorry, I don't know what pedestrian desired lines. Uh, is it oh. several crossings you're talking about? Or, no. uh, yeah. Urban, uh, um, the behavior of the pedestrians, the, their desires to, to yeah, cross their, their, path, their own paths. I don't know if the desired lines is a concept. No, it's not for me, uh, but I mean, when it comes to, to, to pedestrian, again, I think the number one issue is actually to have reasonably or survivable uh, speed on the dangerous vehicles. And that could be two wheelers or, or four wheelers or, or many, many <laughs> uh, wheelers for that matter. I think speed is the... Um, um, the, uh, the most important thing. I don't know what pedestrian desire lines are. Uh, if it's zebra crossing. Oh yeah, shortest national path. Yes, of course it's, I mean, if it, that is something, as you know, as a, a transport uh, planner, that the shortest natural path is, uh, is, is an important thing. If you create a safe passage, that is a very big detour, that doesn't help. Again, it's just that you, you wash your hands and say, well, I've, I've, we have built a, a bridge uh, one kilometer away, but if it's too much of a, of a detour, they will not use it. And we have seen on many occasions here in Sweden where we have built underpasses and still we have pedestrian crossings, crossing uh, the road because it's a too big reroute. So you have to understand how pedestrian think and act. So, I mean, if, if it's relatively easy to reroute cars, you could have put up a one, one way street or you could close a, a street, that's reasonable. But I don't know how to reroute uh, pedestrians. Then you actually have to build a canal or um, big houses or something like that. So you have to be very, careful not believing too much in rerouting pedestrians. If that is the, the, uh, the question, then I, I certainly agree that you have to understand that pedestrians and cyclists for that matter as well, are very difficult to reroute. Yes. Yeah, please, please uh, oh. someone can indicate if that was a, a decent answer to your question. <laughs> Uh, sorry for not understanding it first. No. Yes, I think it was clear. Right, thanks. Uh, we have uh, another question for, for, for Ricard. Yeah, I will, I will read it. It's, um, do the studies they carry out, or you carry out, uh, apply to both imbo imported and exported vehicles? Sorry, I, I didn't get the first part. Sorry. Yeah, I will repeat. Uh, the studies, uh, your studies, you carry out, uh, apply to both uh, imported and exported vehicles. Yeah, I, I assume you mean uh, the test, uh, the vehicle test. They are performed on every vehicle more or less sold in Europe since we are uh, Euro NCAP, so uh, it's both, yes. The, the only cars not tested are very small volume cars or very, very 
extreme sports cars super expensive, which is also small volume. So, but all other cars are are tested. Okay, I think this another question is related to the first, but I will read it. Um, do all the car brands have to meet these safety requirements or just the luxury ones? Because in Mexico, many people buy used cars or cheaper or from cheaper brands. So, no, no, uh, definitely not all. All cars have to, or it's it's of course voluntary to uh, to meet the requirements, but all cars are tested and uh, and rated, and especially the high volume cars. So it's more the extreme expensive cars that can be excluded because they are so low volumes. But uh, around or over over ninety five percent of uh, of sold cars in Europe are testing. Okay, thank and you. And uh, to, to add to that, yeah. it's a combination. In in the beginning, uh, we from Eurancap uh, financed all testing by, by our, ourselves. But of the 55 cars I mentioned tested in 2019, I think Eurancap financed 10 of them. And the rest was actually financed by the car makers themselves. So they volunteered to test because they want the rating. So this is something that uh, all the big car brands want now, the rating of the car. Thank you, Richard. I have a quick question for you. I remember you talked about uh, testing for vehicle safety for bicycles and pedestrians. Um, so which factors in the test determine the car safety for bicycles and pedestrians? I remember you mentioned things like an alarm that alerts you if, if a bicycle is coming out near you before you open the door. <clears throat> uh, but what are other factors that, that you mentioned? Um, you mentioned one about vehicle height, but I didn't get that one very clearly. Uh, so I didn't get the question. What what factors? Yeah, what factors in the vehicle design make it safer for bicycles? Oh, okay. So it's uh, two aspects for passive safety for crash safety. It's uh, partly it's the geometry of the car, uh, how it's shaped, but the most important factor is that it's. Uh, to say it's simple, that the car front is uh, soft or forgiving. And uh, your rank up tests uh, have been uh, pushing that because they used to be very stiff and rigid and especially parts underneath the hood, like the engine block and the suspension and everything was very close to the surface. Uh, so now the distance has been increased in the front to these hard parts, and that's uh, very important. But uh, the big remaining issue for pedestrian impact and cyclist impact is the A-pillars. That's extremely hard to design a way, and no one has shown a solution yet, except for pedestrian airbags, which of course is kind of an expensive solution. but. That, that's kind of the only solution to protect from a pillar impact, which is one of the big causes of fatal uh, impact for pedestrians and cyclists. But, uh, Richard, we also have to, to bear in mind the, the initial speed, of course. I mean, yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. yeah, of course, the, the speed is extremely important, but I took the question of, as uh, yeah, being yeah. the car, car design. <laughs> <laughs> but if you can uh, limit the car speed, uh, it's extremely important. Even if you can't avoid the crash, reducing the speed 10 kilometers per hour uh, alone is a huge difference to the pedestrian and bicyclist. But also from, from a more planning point of view in urban yeah. areas, it's utterly important that we have lower normal speed in urban areas uh, because otherwise it's, it's useless. I've, I mean, 
Yep. I, I know that, that we agree, but I think it couldn't be said too many times. No, no, uh, absolutely. If you look at it from the from the system side, then the speed is the most important factor, always. It doesn't matter how you design the car if the speed is too high. Hmm. But on the other way around, if you have low enough speed, then even a bad car can be <laughs> fairly, fairly safe. So, for sure, the speed is the most for this from the system point of view, for sure. Thank you, Ricard and uh, Lars. And um, just one last question, and everyone feel free to add more questions as well. Um, as I don't mean to take the spotlight too much. Um, for Lars, um, I remember you showed a graph showing a pedestrian risk under uh, different crossing configurations, one with a zebra crossing, one without it, and one that signalized. Uh, what was the legend in the graph? Because um, I will you know, they, like No, no, the, 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 uh, the legend was actually, uh, uh, correctly, it was the zebra crossing and signal control and crossings without. I mean, if you, you uh, a comparable situation without it. And the, the other one was actually age, showing that, of course, young and elderly people are at higher risk. And I actually used it from a scientific point of view, to exclude the weaker part, uh, because that's actually where uh, they could disqualify the zebra crossing by if the young people, children or elderly use zebra crossing, that could be, how should I say, uh, uh, disfavor um, zebra crossings. But if you take away the weaker part, uh, so you only have a middle age, so to say, and that was the middle part of, of the graph. And then it's actually, that's where I have significant and strong results showing that the risk is much higher uh, with zebra crossing and, and also traffic signal compared to, to uh, without zebras. So that was actually showing the expected thing that it's higher risk for, for children and elderly, but taking away that, so, then the, this, the zebra crossing was not a good safety countermeasure. And the interesting thing with the zebra crossing is that it's a perfect political countermeasure. It could show some power and, 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 and uh, action, doesn't cost more than the paint and doesn't disturb the vehicle. But unfortunately, the message today is that you have to, have to disturb uh, the, the, uh, the cars by having lower speed. And these results are totally not valid if you have put up a hump or something, if you have a low speed, of course, because then it's no problem that, that you have a false feeling of safety. If, you, uh, if this interaction is it, at a low speed. So you could still have zebra crossings. We have still zebra crossings in Sweden, but then you have to ensure that they are at, at low speed. So nowadays, in, 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 our, in our requirement, in, uh, on our uh, national roads, we cannot build a new zebra crossing without some speed reducing countermeasures, for instance, a hump and so on. But then it's not a false feeling of safety anymore, right? No, 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 then, then it's not a false, <laughs> then it's a real failure, feeling of safety. But mm. th this false feeling of safety, and I try to illustrate that, that it looks so, so prepared for the pedestrian. And if not, we are, as road infrastructure provider are actually to be blame. It, it's like putting a, 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 a balcony fence that is made of, of paper, <laughs> looks nice, but doesn't hold your, your weight. So it's... Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we see a lot of cases in our countries where we have uh, very well marked zebra crossing, but you know, a three lane road where yeah. vehicles are going at high speed. So um, I understand how that can be um, more dangerous if there's no other protection or speed calming. Yeah, and, and, and that, that I, I think actually is it's, it's on the border of being, how should I, almost criminal, I should say. I mean, it's, it's, it's like 
building houses with balconies without uh, guardrail. Uh, so I think that's rather safe. And I could see in the chat there is something about speed humps and uh, and public transport. And of course, I didn't show the, but the, there are examples of, of speed reducing countermeasures that are more, more um, how should I say, uh, friendly to buses and so on. And then actually there's a new part we call uh, geofencing because it's not nice to be hit by a bus in high speed either. So I think in the future, ISA on, on vehicles and geofencing for, for, for public transport should be one of the future things because you need to have low speed and I don't bother, or it doesn't bother me what way you can do it as soon as you get low speed. Yeah, and and, um, and 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 by law, drivers should be always be give, uh, giving way to, and that is again something like haven't I told you hundreds of times you should hold the glass with two hands? We know that you should give way, but if you're driving too fast and all of a sudden happen to look at the wrong wrong side, and I thought she should be staying, I didn't couldn't imagine that that the, the pedestrian walked out doesn't help because it's a pedestrian that get the, the, the injury. So um, I, norm I normally say that you're not allowed to, to hit a pedestrian, especially not on a zebra crossing. So, and that is again, something that I think we have relied too much on, on leg legislation. So well, if it's well structured and, and uh, you have a penalty for not doing that because I've asked police officer how often they are, they are putting penalties for, for cars not stopping on several crossings. And it's very, very seldom you, 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 you um, enforce that. But of course, if you're a driver and you hit a, a pedestrian on a several crossing, you're bad off, but it doesn't help, doesn't uh, reduce the injuries for, for the pedestrian. So, so good laws like uh, uh, mandatory uh, jailing uh, 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 demands for, for car driving is good, but it's not enough. You need to, to create an environment where these rules could actually be, be reasonably applied. Thanks a lot, Lars. Um, looks like that's it with questions for now, and we've reached the limit of, of our webinar time, but uh, we're very grateful and thankful to both of you, Lars and Ricard, and also to the Vision Zero Academy for uh, co-hosting with us this great uh, series of three uh, webinars. Uh, they've been very informative and um, to everyone, feel free to reach out to the emails that they provided, reach out to us as well about incoming activities with the Vision Zero Challenge, uh, visit our website, uh, visionzerochallenge.org and uh, we hope to be collaborating more in the future um, as partners and also um, we remind everyone here that we'll have an, another webinar uh, next Monday actually um, that will be co-hosted with uh, the company 3M and it will be about uh, different types of signage <clears throat> and um, and, and devices and, um, and temporary measures um, that you can uh, implement in the street. So it would be great to have you for next week's webinar. We'll be sending a newsletter tomorrow with all the details. Uh, so stay tuned and hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you for the great discussion. <laughs>